Street to boost its interest rates up to 18% as it battles against financial collapse. The move is designed to stabilize the Economic messages to win the support of undecided voters. Um, first Samuel chapter three and verse one. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. Drop down to verse 19 and it goes on to say, so Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. Now, we've been talking for several weeks about how to hear the voice of God. This was a big question that many people have asked uh, throughout the years. This is probably one of the number one questions that I get. But tonight, I want to talk about how to steward God's voice. I want to talk about the fact that you and I have to steward God's voice well. That's the whole point of the verses we read in 1 Samuel 3. And I've touched on a little bit of this in our 6 a.m. prayer time because it's very interesting that in 1 Samuel 3, the Bible is very clear that the word of the Lord was rare. What that means is that during this day, God didn't really speak that much to the nation of Israel. God didn't speak that much to the priest Eli and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, that were also serving as priests. And so while God, in essence, didn't speak to the nation and the leaders of the nation, at the same time, though, he spoke to Samuel. And it's interesting because it says that the word of the Lord was rare, but when you look at Samuel, the Lord was with him. And you've got to ask the question, why in the world then was God talking to Samuel, but God didn't talk to the rest of the nation? Why didn't he talk to Eli the priest? Why didn't he talk to Hophni and Phinehas, but he talked to Samuel? Because that phrase... And he let none of his words fall to the ground. Meaning that, that God's words to Samuel were precious. Samuel's words to God were precious. That, that they handled each other's words with value and with care. And the point I want you to understand tonight as we take this next step in learning how to hear the voice of God is that you've got to value God's voice. Meaning... You've got to steward it well. You've got to key in on it. Um, when, when I watch movies with my mom, I don't, I don't particularly like to watch movies with my mother because my mother loves to talk all through the movie. I don't know if you have a mom like that. My mom, you know, somebody, you know, gets in the car and they speed off and she's like, oh, no, they did not. Did you see? I cannot. They just sped off. Like, can you believe? I'm like, ah, ah. Let's watch the movie. And my mom would like to have a conversation with me while I'm watching a movie. And I can't do both well. Because when I'm locked into the movie, I can't really hear her. And I've got to decide in that moment, what am I going to key in on? Meaning, I have to decide what am I going to pay attention to. And that's what I want you to, to understand. When we value God's voice, we pay attention to it. We listen closely. We remember what he says, and we act on it. And this is an issue of stewardship. Now, a lot of people, when they hear the word stewardship, they think only in terms of money. But stewardship is really much bigger than that. The word steward is an old English term that means to manage 
someone else's property or resources well. And the Bible is very clear that God looks at how we manage what belongs to him. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And so everything that we have, everything that we are is not our own. It's God's. It belongs to God. And God looks at how we manage what he's given us to steward. And whether or not we manage it well determines whether or not he gives us more of it. The Bible says that if you are faithful over a few things, he'll make you rulers over uh, many things. One of my life verses is, is Luke 12, 48. To whom much is given, much is required. And so all of that points to stewardship. But stewardship is bigger than just an issue of money. It's about everything. And so guess what? Stewardship also relates to hearing God's voice. If you really want to hear God's voice, when he speaks, you've got to steward it well. Because when God speaks to us, if we're faithful in handling the word that he gives us, then guess what? He'll speak more. But if we're not faithful, if we're careless, if we let his words fall to the ground, then the question becomes, why should he say anything else to us? I want to show you this verse in Mark chapter 4 and verse 24. And notice what it says. This is Jesus in Mark 4 and 24. He says this. Then he said to them, take heed of what you hear. Notice this. He says, take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use it, it will be measured to you. And you, to who? He says, and to you who hear, what will happen? More will be given. He says, take heed what you hear. He says, and, and to those of you that do hear, more will be given. God will speak even the more. And so tonight, I, I want to walk you through three ways that you can steward God's voice well. I hope you opened the app. I hope you got your notes right there in your mobile device because I want to go through some things quicker than others. But I just want you to have this in your notes. And, and these are the kind of notes that you need to email to yourself or maybe put in your Bible because uh, I won't be able to go through all of this. But this is clearly stuff that I want you and I think you will need to go back over um, in the future. And so in order to steward God's voice well, three things you've got to understand and commit to doing. Number one, really listen to him. Number one, really, really listen to him. See, often we are so inundated with the stuff in our lives. This is why the opening video uh, for this series is so poignant, is so on time, because the opening video of this frequency series is an accurate depiction of life for so many people. How many of you agree with that? You know, you got everything going on. There are so many times uh, in our own home where my wife is trying to talk to me and the kids are, are yelling and screaming at each other and talking to each other and then they want to talk to us and then the dog is barking and TV is on and, and everybody wants everybody to pay attention and I am just not that gifted. <laughs> so I often find myself looking for the remote saying, wait, wait a second, turn the TV off, kids, shh. Now, sweetie, what, what were you trying to say? Meaning I can't really listen to everything at the same time. And for many of you, your life is just like that. And so if that is your life with the cacophony of all of these different sounds, when God speaks, the question is, can you really listen to him? Now, what I want you to understand is that when he does speak, though, it is so important that what you ought to do is, is kind of similar to, to my flow. I mean, turn the TV down, t tell people, you mean, call them back or quiet down. Because what I want to do in that moment is I'm trying to strain to listen to what my wife has to say. And that's the same way that we have to approach God. We've, we've got to tune out everything else and strain to hear him. That's what I mean when I say really listen to him. See, God speaks to those who really seek to hear him, people that are hungry for his voice, people that approach him with humble hearts, but also those who are willing to act on what he says. Now, what the Bible is very clear in showing us is that God does speak in a variety of ways. And I want to run through really quickly what some of those ways are, because I think it's important if you really want to listen to him, then you got to understand how he speaks. And so let me give you a few of the ways that God speaks in the Bible. And I want to run through this in your notes, 
There are uh, scripture references beside each one of these points because I don't have the time to go through every single scripture, but I want you to get this. So let's see if we can go through it really quickly. God speaks through circumstances. That's a big one. God speaks through circumstances. The reference there, um, and this is just one among many, is the book of Jonah. God spoke to Jonah, and if you know the story, you know what Jonah did. Jonah did not heed God's voice. So God tells Jonah to go in one direction. Jonah goes in the opposite direction. So because Jonah didn't heed God's voice, guess what? God spoke through a circumstance. He gets swallowed up by this big fish. He spends three days in the belly of a whale. Ultimately, he repents and says, all right, God, all right, all right, I hear you. He comes out of the the fish, ultimately goes and does what God told him to do the first place. Why is this important? Because you got to always examine your circumstance to see if God is speaking through it. Regardless of the circumstance, you want to you want to kind of have your antennas up. You want to strain to listen in to find out, God, are you saying something to me through this? And in order to 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 get to the truth of that, it helps if you ask a couple of questions. One question is, what's really happening in my life right now? Second question is. God, are you trying to say something to me through this? What are you saying to me through this? This is really listening because often what we do is we we quickly respond to circumstances with our flesh. Oh, I can't believe that just happened. Oh, my gosh. We go out instead of going in. We look around instead of looking up. God, And so you got to always ask, God, what what are what are are you saying something to me in this? The next one is God speaks through wise counsel. I'm not going to spend a lot of time about this because we talked about it extensively on last week. This is all through Proverbs that we seek, we ought to seek godly counsel because that's a part of the way that we hear the voice of God. Remember last week I shared with you, you don't run to others for them to hear from God for you. But instead you go to godly counsel so that they can prayerfully confirm or either reject what you think you hear God saying. Another one is that God can speak through peace. We talked about this a little bit on last week, Colossians 3.15. It means that God's peace will rule your hearts. That word rule I taught you means an umpire. It means to reign, to be the deciding factor. God speaks, and when you know it's God, it'll be, there will be a peace, an unshakable, undeniable peace. If you do not have peace about the decision, it is not from the Lord. Said it last week, let me say it again. Don't move forward unless you have peace. Another one is that God speaks through people. This is a pattern that's shown all through Scripture. God will bring certain people into the lives of others and speak through them. God spoke through Moses for the nation of Israel to come out of Egypt. God spoke through Joshua for them to get into the promised land. It's all through Scripture. God spoke through Ezra to rebuild the temple, through Nehemiah to rebuild the wall. Over and over and over again, I will speak through the prophet for those particular people at that particular time. So God will bring certain people into your life. This is why you got to be really careful how you handle people. Because you never know, they may be an instrument for which God wants to speak to you and even help you move into your next place in Him. Here's another one. God speaks through dreams and visions. God speaks through dreams and visions. This is how God spoke to Joseph. This is how God spoke to Solomon, Jacob, Peter, John, even Paul. And it goes on and on and on throughout Scripture. The, uh, the Scripture references, you got Acts 2, you got Joel 2 and 28. Um, I want you to know that God also still speaks to us this way today. This is a promise that God makes in the book of Joel. He says, I pour out my spirit among all men. And he goes on and says, and your sons and daughters will dream dreams and prophesy. This is the same Scripture that Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost says, this is exactly what God was talking about through the prophet Joel. Here's a big one. God speaks through our thoughts. Amos 4 and 13 literally says that, that God will make known his ways through our thoughts. Um, A good prime example of this, I put it in your notes, Matthew 1 and verse 19, says that Joseph was thinking to himself when he found out that Mary was pregnant. He's like, now whose baby is this, Mary? What is up with this? And so he was thinking to himself, the Bible says, that he ought to literally leave her. And while he was thinking it, God spoke to him. 
Now, let me be clear here. You got to be very careful with this one. Because every thought you have is not from God. Thoughts can also be placed in our mind by the enemy. I taught on Sunday about spiritual warfare. The greatest battleground is not out there, it's right here. That's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. And it goes on to say, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Because there will be some thoughts. And you're like, Lord Jesus, help me up in here, up in here. So every, every thought will not be from God. So when you get a thought, you got to judge. Now, is this from God? How do you judge it? Does it line up with Scripture? Is it in line with the character of God? What is Holy Spirit saying to you, right, in that moment? Is there peace? Does the peace of God reign? I'll give you an example. I was recently supposed to be I'm going and sharing with uh, a pastor in, in their church uh, that um, look, look up to us and our church and uh, just a brother in the faith, and he's doing a great work there. And um, he'd asked me at the beginning of the year, I, I need you to come out, pour into my wife and I and our leaders and uh, speak to the church and the whole nine. And uh, I started praying because the date was approaching, and, and I started just praying, asking God to show me, you know, what do I need to share? What, what, what is Holy Spirit really leading me to to, to really just impart into that group. And, and I reached out to him and I just said, hey, could you send me some more details about the meetings? Uh, I'm praying and really want to get prepared. And he sent me a note back and he said, man, I'm really going through, my, my mother is struggling right now with late stage dementia and um, he's the primary care provider for her. And he just poured his heart out and just said, I'm really, really, really going through right now. I need your prayers. It's a hard time for my wife and I and our family, blah, 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 blah. And so my wife and I immediately started, we just started praying for him. And then on Sunday, as I was on my way home, Holy Spirit put him on my heart in a significant way. Just that was a heaviness that I felt for him. And I came home, I went into my office and I sat down and I had the thought. And the thought was, I need to tell him that he does not need to worry about trying to organize a meeting for me to come. That he needs to focus on his family, take care of his mother. It was a thought. I said, but uh, is that me? Is that you, God? But I felt such a leading of Holy Spirit. So I sent him a text message. He called me the next morning and he said, he was just weeping on the phone and said, man, I can't believe that you that you said that. He said, I, was, I wanted to say that to you, but I was so embarrassed. I didn't want to cancel on you, and I know you already have your plane ticket and all of that, and I just, I'm so embarrassed by all of that. I said, stop. You don't need to be embarrassed. This is what I really believe is the right thing to do. Take care of your mother. Rally the church to pray. I'll do a video, send it, you know, tell the church some things, et cetera, et cetera. What am I telling you? I'm telling you this story because it started with a thought. And I began to judge, is this God, is it not God? So God will speak through our thoughts. God will speak through nature. God will speak through nature. This is in John 12, Romans 8 even talks about this. Romans chapter 1, rather, in verse 18 talks about this. How, how nature itself makes known the evidence of God. If you've ever been to certain places, uh, one of our favorite places, my wife and I, is Sedona, Arizona. And we we love Sedona or go to the Grand Canyon or just, man, it's some, some of the most breathtaking places around the beautiful state of Alabama. And you cannot go in those environments if you're really listening without hearing God. I'm telling you, God speaks through nature. John 12, God speaks from heaven. The people thought it was thunder. Another one, God can speak through supernatural manifestations. God literally can speak through the supernatural. He spoke to Moses through a burning bush. He spoke to Gideon through a fleece. He spoke to Saul on the Damascus road through a blinding light. He spoke to Balaam through a donkey. God can speak through the supernatural. God speaks through the Bible. This ought to be a routine for us, but it is important that you remember this. 2 Timothy 3 says that all scripture is God-breathed. I love it. God literally. This is why when you, when you get into his word, you get close to him. Ever been so close to somebody you can feel him breathing? 
That's what it's like when you get into the Word. When you get into the Word, God is speaking. God speaks in a general sense through the Word, but then also God will speak in a very specific way by drawing our attention to a particular passage. So many days at 6 a.m. as we've been going through the 21 days of prayer, when we get into individual prayer, I'll, I'll go down and I'll fall on my knees and I'll pray and talk to the Lord. And so many days over the last couple of weeks, God has said, okay, after I finish doing that, open your Bible. And, I, and he will literally take me to a specific scripture. And I hear the voice of God so clearly. Because he will do that. He will speak through that. God will also next speak through a whisper. That's, second, that's 1 Kings 19. That's a still small voice. The story is that Elijah wants to hear from God, and initially, God rains fire down from heaven, and, and he's thinking that God is going to speak the same way the next time. This is why you've got to be careful. Don't ever put God in a box. Don't ever think there's one way to worship, there's one way to do this, because it's what we've always done, because God is always shifting and moving. So he speaks through the fire falling in one sense in Elijah's life, but then the next time he speaks through a still, small voice, a whisper. The final one, God can speak through worship. Worship is one of the significant ways that God speaks to us. Acts 13 and uh, verse 2 says, while they were worshiping, Holy Spirit spoke to them. Zephaniah 3 literally says that as we are lifting our praise and our worship to God, that sometimes God will literally sing over us. This is what prophetic song is about. This is why sometimes we're in a moment of worship and there's a song that has not been written and we just start singing and chanting. That's God singing over us. The main point that I want you to get, I took you through all of that because the main point I want you to get is this. If we're going to hear God's voice, we really have to listen to him. We have to tune into the frequency of heaven in order to hear God's voice. It is not a question of whether or not he is speaking. The question is, are you really listening? Jeremiah 7 and verse 13, I love it. God says, while you've been sinning, I've been trying to talk to you, but you refuse to listen. What does it mean? God says, I've been talking the whole time, but it's, it's been your sin, it's been your stuff that has precluded you from tuning in. So you got to really listen. Here's the second thing, number two, you got to respond with humility. You're not a good steward of, of God's voice if when he speaks... You respond with pride. Oh, I got my word. Woo! Oh, let me tell you what God said. I mean, he didn't say that to you. He said this to me. When you, when you respond with pride or you share what he spoke to you in a haughty way, that's not responding with humility. Another bad example of, of stewardship when it relates to God's voice is when he speaks and he really wants to talk to us, but our ears are closed. We, we don't, like, uh, I don't want to hear it. This is often why in the book of Revelation, when God is speaking to the seven churches, he repeats this phrase over and over and over again. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Think about that. He who has an ear. It is not that people back then didn't have ears. He was literally saying those whose ears are open. Those whose hearts and spirits are open to hear this. Another bad example of stewarding God's voice is when he speaks, and you initially grab that word, but then you allow life and fear and everything else to cause you to drop the word. It's, I, was, I, was, I was praying about this this morning as, as I was literally sitting in, in a coffee shop after prayer, waiting on a, a counseling session, and I was just meditating on this, and, and Holy Spirit gave me an, an image, a picture of a pregnant woman. So imagine this. Because the word is a seed. The word is, can, can bring life, can, can create things. That's the power of God's voice and the word of God. Let's just say hypothetically that my wife was pregnant. She's not pregnant, but if, let's just say if she, if she was. And I, and I asked you to take care of her. I put her in your care. And you said, oh, no, I can't help you. Do you think I will ask you again to take care of my wife? What if, what, if, what if I want to put her in your care and you're like, oh, I'm sorry, I got something to do, and you just drop her? 
Do you think I will ask you to care for my wife again? That's the power of the word of God, but that's also what it feels like when God wants to speak. But life and the worries of life cause you to just drop what he's trying to give you. This is what the parable of the sower is about. Look at this really quickly with me in in Luke 8, and let's pick it up at verse 4. I'm looking at the clock because I got to go really quickly. Is this all right? You guys good? All right. Look at the parable of the sower. It, It says this. It says, while a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on the rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, and it came up and it yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. When he said this, he called out, look at this, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. There it is. His disciples asked him what the parable meant, and he said, well, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing, they may not see, though hearing, they may not understand. He's talking about the Jews whose minds and ears were closed. He says, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are those who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Let me unpack this. As I am teaching the word to you, as any of our pastors and ministers are sharing the word of God with you, as our worship team, the songs we sing are the word of God. And as they are singing a song, I'm healed, I'm free. The word of God is coming to you. The voice of God is speaking in that moment. What the enemy, though, wants is he doesn't want you to believe it. So talking about spiritual warfare... The greatest sometimes attack is what happens between the word being given and whether or not you decide to receive it. Because, you know, the enemy, oh, whatever, that sounds good. I heard a message like that before. Yeah, really? You know, you got you to gotta sift through all of that. That's that seed. But he continues on. He says, those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it. Woo, that's my word. Dun, 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 You know, we, that's the God of word. We shout. But they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. Meaning, it's word to dance on, but you don't build on it because it hasn't settled in your heart. So I grew up hearing Psalm 23, that the Lord is my shepherd. But, but him being my shepherd didn't settle in my heart until after difficulties came. Because notice what it says. It says, in a time of testing comes, and they fall away. The word has got to be tested. You don't have word to walk in if you don't have a problem you need to walk through. Do you hear? Oh, okay. Um, but let me continue. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they don't mature. So when you got the word, but then a storm comes. Lord, am I going to have enough to pay this bill? And you have a decision to make. Am I going to heed the word of the Lord? Let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. He will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Am I going to heed that word? Or am I going to go to whatever quick fix source I can figure out because I sure need to pay this bill? Then he goes on and says, but the seed on good soil stands for those with the noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. So the sower casts the seed. The seed is the word of God. The sower is, is God. He's speaking. The soil, it's your heart. Here's the big question. What kind of soil are you? What's the soil of your heart like? Is is it the path? Is it the rocky soil? Is it the thorns? Are you good soil? Are you receptive? Look at Luke 8 and verse 18, which is right after this. Notice what Jesus says. He says, therefore, consider carefully 
how you what? How you listen. Because whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have, will be taken from them. He says, pay attention to how you listen. Because if you listen well, guess what? God's going to speak even the more. Part of the issue for many believers is that God is speaking. We've just gotten kind of lazy with his word, and we don't hear it anymore. Meaning the word has fallen all around us. Seed has fallen all over the place. But maybe because of the condition of our heart, maybe someone hurt us, or maybe we were offended, and so the soil of our hearts is bad. Think about Joseph for a second. Genesis 37, many of you remember this story. Joseph was 17 when he began to hear from God. And God speaks to Joseph in dreams. And because he's young and he's immature and he's impetuous, Joseph runs out and tells his brothers, let me tell you what God said to me. All y'all going to bow down. You hear me? And the Bible says they were angry and, you know, started plotting to kill him. Then he has a second dream. God, and God speaks to him in a dream. He runs out and tells mom and dad, hey, I heard from the Lord. Let me tell you something. I know your mom and dad, are, you know, but y'all going to be bound down too. Now, Joseph's decisions to share his dream were largely because of youthful ignorance. The point is he didn't handle it right. He didn't receive that word with humility. Here is the amazing thing about this. God never speaks to Joseph in a dream again. Never, not one time after that incident, does God ever speak to Joseph in a dream again. God does continue to work in Joseph's life. We know that. Pit, Potiphar's house, prison, palace. Yes, God moves. Yes, God works in Joseph's life, but he never speaks to Joseph in a dream again. Why? He didn't handle it with humility. You got to receive the word of God. You got to receive God's voice with humility. You don't, you don't use the word, God's voice, as a way to make ourselves look better. You, you, you don't do that. You receive the word with humility. Oh, can I share with you for a few more minutes? Go to James 4 really quickly. I want you to get this, and, and then I'm, I'm going to finish up. It says this. Let me tell you why humility is so important. James 4, beginning in verse 6, he says, but he gives us more grace. This is why the scripture says that God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. He opposes the proud. That word oppose means he goes to battle against. So, so picture this, because I know we, we like football. P picture this. When you're humble, it's like playing on God's team, right? You get to run the ball. You know, you get to score touchdowns. God's dropping back, throwing you bombs, touchdown, touchdown, touchdown. God goes ahead of you, clears the path, a big old hole for you to step into your purpose. That's what it's like when you play on God's team. But then James says, but when you are proud, when you are arrogant, God opposes the proud. It literally means that God says, no, you are not on my team anymore. Instead of playing with me, you're playing against me. And can I tell you that God's defense is better than Alabama's? Can I tell you that? So, so you end up, you end up trying to run the ball. You get sacked and fumbles and there are turnovers and you certainly do not score. Because now instead of playing with God, we're playing against him. God opposes the proud. So when you, when, when you want to hear God's voice, you've got to receive it with humility. And here's the last thing as I close. Three things to steward God's voice well. The last thing is act on what he says. Let me say that again. Act on. This is what the Bible means when it says heed. You do well to heed the word of the Lord. Heed means act on it. This is a really big deal to God. One of the biggest issues that Jesus had with the Jews of that day was that they had all of the history and all of the law, and they were making everybody else follow it. 
but they were not following it themselves. He even says in Luke 6, 46, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? See, there is a difference between knowing him as your Savior and knowing him as Lord. Lord, Lord means, Lord means, I submit to you. Lord means, you control my life. You control my mouth. You control my tongue. You control everything. That's Lord. Savior is, God, I'm so thankful that I'm saved, and if I die tonight, I'm going to spend an eternity with you. Thank you for saving me. A lot of people are saved. They don't know him as Lord. Because Lord means, whatever you want, God, I'm going to do it. Wherever you want me to go, I'm going to go. Whatever you tell me, I got it. I, I, I love Game of Thrones. My wife and I and my father-in-law and mother-in-law, we're big Game of Thrones people. I don't know if you watch Game of Thrones. Uh, but I love how, you know, the mother dragons or some of the other kings, when they, when they get ready to meet somebody else, they say, I, I'll, I'll meet them if they bow the knee. Meaning if you come from another place and you, wanna, you want an audience with the queen or the king, you first have got to bow the knee. People come into the court and you bow and say your grace and, you know, our, our life is in your hands or we submit to you. That's what it means when Jesus is Lord. I bend the knee. Whatever you want me to do, God, is what I'm going to do. I'm not just going to entertain it like, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to do it. Oh, I think you missed that. You with me? Bessemer, you with me? Online, you with me? I've been asked for an example for, you know, people who say, what would you mentor me? What would you mentor me? Would you... You be my pastor, you know, at a distance. I need a, I need a spiritual father, that kind of thing. And then they come to me and they say, you know, I'm in a bind. And I say, okay, well, let me tell you what I think you ought to do. I prayed about it. Here's what I hear the Lord saying. And then sometimes they, they heed the word and then they come back, great praise report. Sometimes I say, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> and they go on and do their own thing and they fall off the cliff. Now, guess what? The next time they call me and say, I, I need some help. What do you think I'm going to do? And I'm going to say, well, I don't know if this is as big a priority for me as it was the last time. Because I, I'm going to start questioning. If I, like, are you going to treasure what I say to you? Like, if I take the time to stop what I'm doing and pray and hear from God for you, are you going to value that? Because if not, there are other things that I could do. See, if you really want to hear from God, he's not only got to be Lord, but you got to know as Lord that his word to you is not a suggestion. This is so good. You know, it, it, God is not up in heaven saying, well, you know, I mean, you know, hey, you can consider this if you like. You know, you do what you want to do. But, you, know, just, you know, you might want to consider, you know. No, 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 no. He is the author of the universe. He holds the world in his hands. He created us. He purposed us. You remember Jonah's story, right? I mentioned it earlier. God tells Jonah, you know, to go one way. Jonah says, I don't want to do it. Goes in another direction. Runs into the belly of a whale. And he's just there. And that's what God will do. Sometimes when we don't heed his, his word, God will let us just run off the cliff. And then he'll show up and say, hey, how is that going, by the way? I'm just asking, I mean, you know, you okay? God will often do that. I know he's done that sometimes in my own life. Well, I knew what God said, but, but I, I, he wasn't Lord yet. I'm going to do it my way. And brick wall, brick wall, he says, you're kicking against the bricks. And then after you get tired, he says, hey, how's that coming, by the way? That's what happened with Jonah. After Jonah was like, I don't want to die in this well. I'm sorry, God. He comes out. God's like, oh, hey, you ready to go now? <laughs> I've been waiting on you. All right, let's go. He did it with the nation of Israel. Takes them out of the slavery, brings them into the promised land. He even says to Moses, let me tell you what's going to happen now. If they do what I ask them to do, it's going to go well. But if they rebel, yeah, you know, I'm going to allow some other individuals to come in and take them and dispossess this land, put them in exile for a little while. But even if they in exile make a decision that they're going to follow me and do what I say, I bring them back. You see the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. It takes them 40 years to get to one place. It takes Jesus 40 days. I always tell people, God's going to get his 40 out of you. You determine if it's going to be 40 years or 40 days. 
What is the difference? Jesus says, it is written, it is written, it is written. He only did what the Father told him to do. So, zoop. I mean, he goes quickly into purpose. Let me say this to you as I close. Real breakthrough, real breakthrough is not about how much word you know. It is about how much word you do.